Father in heaven, we, we marvel that while we are in these earthly tents that are failing, we are ever mindful of the burden that we carry of sin within. What a comfort to know that there is one in the very presence of God pleading for us, pointing over and over again to the wounds in his hands and his side, his feet. Our forgiveness is secured by him, your son, our savior, the one whom we love but have not yet seen. And we pray, Lord, that um, while you delay a little longer and while we go on a little longer in these failing bodies, that you would encourage us today with your word that we might be fortified to live a life that is pleasing to you until we see you face to face. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and let's open to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We're inching our way through Romans chapter 6. As you're turning there, I love a good movie that pits the good guy against the bad guy. I just like those kinds of movies. But I have to tell you about the part of those movies that drives me absolutely crazy. It's the part when the good guy, at some point, inevitably, has to hand over to the bad guy his weapon. It happens all the time, doesn't it? For some reason, the good guy has got himself into a predicament that, that forces him to have to hand over to the bad guy his weapon. And you know at that point in the movie that it's about to dive bomb into despair for a bit. And that's what drives me crazy, is now I have to work through that agonizing descent. Things are going to get worse before they get better. Now, if that happens once in a movie, I, I'm good. I can endure that. But I recently watched an old Indiana Jones movie, and it actually happened like three times. How good of a good guy are you if that happens more than once? That's, that's my question. And I grew extremely weary of it. And as agonizing as it is to see that happen once or more in a movie, what is absolutely most agonizing in this life is to watch when we as believers in Jesus Christ hand over the members of our bodies as weapons to sin so that sin can become weaponized to achieve unrighteousness in our lives. Obviously, far more is at stake in your life and in mine when you hand over your eyes, your mouth, your tongue, your ears, your hands, your feet, your faculties in your body to your enemy sin, and then sin is weaponized with your members to perform all kinds of unrighteousness in your life and in mine. And the staggering thing is that happens in the believer only because you and I, believer, consent to actually handing over our members as weapons. We are no longer slaves to sin. But we do it anyway. But the good news in Romans chapter 6 is great news, and it is your hope. It is that grace says, do not do that anymore. This does not have to happen in the life of the believer. By grace's profound and powerful achievement in your life, believer, grace has reconstituted you. It has changed you. It has positioned you in Christ in such a way that you don't have to hand over your members like a weapon to your inward enemy called sin. The battle for your own personal holiness every day, it's a fierce battle indeed. But grace has achieved a position of strength for you such that 
you never have to hand over any portion of you like a weapon to sin so that it can perform unrighteous acts in your life. In fact, the good news is so good that not only does that not have to happen, but the good news of grace is that you can positively instead hand over yourself and the members of your body to God, and then he's weaponized with them for righteous ends in your life. Let me read chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self is crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments or weapons of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and present your members as instruments or weapons of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but you are under grace. Are you sure of that? Are you certain about that? Are you confident about that? Do you believe that? Do you take this new you that's dead to sin and, and who is alive to God, do you take that as a settled fact? Well, if you do, if you take that as a settled fact for you, then you're ready for what grace has for you in verses 12 to 14 today in your fight against sin now remember, the gospel is defending the grace of God in Romans chapter 6 from two slanderous charges against grace. The first charge against it is something like this, that, that grace is in some kind of a mutually benefiting relationship with sin. I mean, after all, grace called you as a sinner to not try to do good works with law, to lessen your sinfulness first, but grace just called you to believe Jesus Christ crucified for forgiveness of sins and called you to do that while you were ungodly. And by grace you did, and you were declared righteous with a status of righteousness, the only status of righteousness that pleases God and that he accepts. It's his righteousness. And so some slanderously conclude that grace, therefore, obviously isn't concerned about sin or ungodliness in the life of the believer. And in fact, it even benefits from the presence of sin, chapter 5, where sin, uh, chapter 5, verse 20, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And so the first defense of grace that the gospel provides is what we've been looking at for several weeks. Gospel defense number one, I'm just going to review through this quickly this morning. Grace, we could summarize it this way, grace in no way, in no way is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. Therefore, if it's not in partnership with sin, it is against sin in your life. And therefore, grace's fight against sin in the believer, number one, is a matter of death and life for you, for me. The whole premise of this chapter is that we died to sin, fundamentally changing our relationship to sin, and therefore we live differently. We died and we live. It's a matter of death and life for us. It requires me also to investigate 
and know grace's achievements. Over and over, we are told, you can't not know this. Do you not know? Do you not know? Grace's fight against sin in the believer is rooted in my union with Christ. We are baptized into Christ. We have been buried with him. We have been raised with him. We are crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, raised with Christ. We are in him, in Christ Jesus, verse 11. It's all rooted, this fight against sin is rooted in union with Christ. He is not over there watching me over here, separate from him, fight against sin. I'm with him. I'm in him. Grace's fight against sin at the very, very beginning of your life as you came out publicly with your belief in Jesus Christ, Grace's fight against sin in you broadcasted your changed relationship to sin through your baptism. Number four, when you go under the water and come back out, out, out of it, it doesn't achieve a changed relationship to sin. It simply broadcasts the changed relationship to sin that grace achieved in you. Five and six go together in verses five to seven and eight to 10. Grace's fight against sin in the believer assures me that my union with Christ is complete twice. He runs through this. If we've been buried with him, we certainly also shall be raised with him. We believe that if, if we have been crucified with him and buried with him, we believe that we shall rise with him or have been raised with him and walk in newness of life. And both of those assurances and strong belief in that frees us from slavery to sin and means that we have irreversible new life. Number seven, grace's fight against sin and the believer commands me for the first time in verse 11 to take my death to sin and my life toward God as a settled fact. There's the first command that grace gives after 10 verses of telling you what you are in grace. So now what I want to do is I want to shift the PowerPoint just a moment so you can see actually 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 today all together on the same screen, uh, and we'll add number 8 today. Therefore, grace's fight against sin in the believer, number 8, commands me to deny sin's attempt to reign over me as king in my failing body. That's what grace does. It commands me to deny sin's attempt to reign over me as king in my failing body. Verse 12, therefore. That means what flows next in verse 12 comes from taking as a settled fact in verse 11 that indeed you are not the same person that you once were in the presence of the same sin. Consider yourselves dead to sin. Your relationship to sin has been radically changed. You are no longer a slave. And that means that what comes next in verse 12 comes from taking as a settled fact that indeed you also are not the same person in the presence of the same God. Consider yourselves alive to him in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Now notice first that this, what this statement just does. This statement assumes that sin still remains in you, having been saved by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. It, it assumes that sin still is in you. And even more is said than sin is still present in you, but sin that is still present in you reigns as king wherever it can. It's like sin goes about your life carrying a throne with it, and wherever it can throw down its throne and declare dominion over its newfound territory, it'll do it. Sin is ready to reign as king at a moment's notice. Now, just a reminder in chapter 6 of what we've been saying here and what, what's been said in Romans 6, that grace has made it clear over and over throughout Romans 6 is that grace has changed you, believer, radically in your relationship to sin. You are not the same person in the presence of the same sins, but grace has never once claimed to have changed the nature of sin when you are united with Christ. Do you understand that? Nor has grace ever claimed to change sin's desire to reign as king. Wherever it is, Sin carries its throne and it seeks to throw down its throne and establish its monarchy there. Sin does not now say, well, now that grace has come in, I've kind of lost my appetite for reigning as king. I think I'll go find something else to do in your life. Sin does not do that. 
And the territory that sin would love to reign as king over is, verse 12, in your mortal body. Mortal there means perishable, perishing, corruptible, corrupting body. It is your doomed to die body. I'm calling it our failing body. This body, believer, it won't last forever. No matter what you try to do to make it look like it's not getting closer to the grave, it is getting closer to the grave. It is right now failing you. It is your titanic body. Because once that ship struck the iceberg, there was nothing they could do from keeping it from going down into the bottom of the icy sea. And so your mortal body is going down. It's failing you. And it's just a matter of when. It's a matter of time. And cinder, sin wanders about your body's titanic deck, looking for a place to throw down its throne that it might reign as king in your failing body as it sinks slowly into the icy grave. And the rest of verse 12 tells you how sin throws down its throne and achieves its kingly reign. Here's its goal, so that you obey its lusts. You see, sin has evil passions and evil cravings and lusts, and those lusts love to exploit your failing body. Those lusts capitalize their enticements and their pleasures in your titanic body. And sin as king gets your obedience through those lusts which are exploiting your failing body. Your body is not the source of sin. But your failing body is like a playground for sin, a petri dish for sin. And sin, as a king carrying about a throne, entices you to obey those passions, those evil cravings and lusts. And then sin throws down its throne and bosses you around as your body fails and sinks into the grave. This is the strategy of sin. So I want to take you back, believer, and I want you to think about what it was like to not be a believer what it was like before Christ saved you. Go back into that sinful slab of solidarity that we were in with Christ. You remember the idea of a concrete slab, lots of little rocks in it throughout. Romans 5 had made it clear that one of the ways, part of what God has to do to save us is he must jackhammer us out of that solidarity with the rest of sinful human race, and he must extract us from there. I want you to go back there for a moment and think in your mind. When you were in solidarity with one another, with Adam before Christ, and in his grace, he jackhammered you out. In that slab of solidarity in sin, sin reigned as king in this way there, in you, in me, in all of us. It had lusts. It sent into our failing bodies. And these evil cravings, these evil lusts and passions exploited every square inch of our titanic bodies. And as we gave into those lusts and obeyed them, sin threw down its throne and it reigned as king over me and over you and over all of us in that slab. We were hopeless, helpless slaves of those lusts and sin and we were not capable at all not even once, of resistance. And what grace is now telling us, believer, is that it came to us in the preaching of the gospel, and grace said to us in that sinful slab of solidarity, it said, believe Jesus Christ. Believe him. And by that grace, through faith, we were declared righteous with a status of righteousness, the only status of righteousness that God accepts his. And grace has also told us that it jackhammered us out of that sinful slab of solidarity by uniting us with Christ crucified and buried. And that changed us. Grace changed us in our relationship to sin. And grace took us out and united us with Christ and his people. We're with the believers in the church. 
which results in a new life, newness of life to live with Christ. And grace changed us in the presence of God. We now are alive to him instead of plotting his death if we ever saw him. And as we take that achievement of grace as a settled fact, I'm dead to sin and I am alive to God, I consider that, I contemplate that, I take that as a settled fact. As we do that in our mortal failing bodies, as it's going down, grace says now, do not let sin throw down its throne any mirror in your failing body so that you obey its lust. Listen, what you could never resist before By grace's achievements within you, you now can resist and must. This is sin's way, kingly way. It has not changed. But you have, believer. You've changed by grace. And the command from grace for you, believer, from all that grace has achieved is that you deny sin's attempts to reign as king in your failing body. If you're you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, then grace has not yet achieved anything any of this in your life, and so this command to you is senseless. You are absolutely, as of now, incapable of obeying it because you're still the same old slave in the presence of the same old king, sin. But grace tells you that freedom from that sin is found in believing Jesus Christ, in gaining him by faith. And a whole new life begins there. If you have not yet believed Christ, will you today? Will you even right now where you're sitting, will you just cast everything that you know of yourself on everything that you know of him? You'll spend the rest of your life discovering more and more about the one that you're trusting in And you'll spend the rest of your life learning more and more about how mortal and failing you are in your body. Grace is fight against sin in the life of the believer. Number eight, commands me to deny sin's attempt to reign over me as king in my failing body. Number nine, grace is fight against sin in the life of the believer. Commands me to not present portions of my failing body to sin. Verse 13, and it says... That means 13 is going to expand on verse 12. Well, what would it look like more specifically to not let sin reign in your failing body with the goal that you do not obey its lusts? Well, verse 13, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Referring to the members of your body, that there is tied back to your mortal body in verse 12. But now portions of your failing titanic body are in view. Do not go on presenting those members, those portions. What what does that mean? Can I just give you an idea? Go back to chapter 3 for a moment. Look at verse 10. Watch this. Here's the sinful slab of solidarity that we were in with Adam and everybody else. Watch this. There is none righteous. Not even one. There is none in that slab who understands. There is none in that slab who seeks for God. All of them, all of the pebbles in that slab have turned aside. Watch this. Together, they're together in solidarity with each other. Together they have become useless. There's not one. There's none who does good. There's not even one. Now watch this. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet 
are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. There's all kinds of unrighteousness going on there in chapter 3. The idea in the verb back in chapter 6, verse 13, do not go on presenting, is stop offering. Stop offering the portions of your failed body to sin. That was what was going on in the sinful slab of solidarity that we had. You saw that in chapter 3. That is what was going on. As former slaves to sin, we just handed over to sin piece by piece our members, portion by portion our members of our body, member by member. And how Paul says this is very descriptive, and it takes us back to our introduction. Stop presenting or offering your portions, your members to sin like they are instruments or more likely weapons in this context. Do not think of the members of your titanic body as weapons marred by unrighteousness that then weaponize sin to carry out unrighteousness in your life. Here's the imagery. That tyrant king, sin, is still present within and is looking for weapons that will arm it for unrighteous ends. That's what's going on. In the unbeliever, the tyrant king has free access to any and all the members of the failing body of the unbeliever. Lusts are being obeyed everywhere in that failing body. Sin, the tyrant king, has thrown down its throne in that failing body and demands the unbeliever to hand over one member of his failing body after another as a weapon marred by unrighteousness. Sin, then, is not just a king. But sin is a weaponized tyrant king armed with unrighteousness in your members as an unbeliever for unrighteous ends. And the difference between that unbeliever and the believer is grace. It's just the grace of God. That's all. That's the only difference. The grace of God in the gospel has achieved an amazing reconstitution in the one who believes. The believer is postured now for something completely new, a new posture to take with his own failing body. The believer's body is failing too. There is now for the first time, by grace, there is equipping in the new man the power to resist the maniacal monarchy of sin. Sin says to the believer what it always has said. Give me your eyes so that you can't see the fear of the Lord anymore. Give me your throat that people through what you say might die in it like an open grave. Give me your lips. Oh, you could put poison under your lips so well. Give them to me. Give me your mouth. It's full of cursing and bitterness. I, I need that. Give me your feet. Do you remember how you used to run to do evil? Sin says to you, believer, what it has always said. I have unrighteous ends in mind, and I want the failing members of your body. The believer, because of grace's achievements within through union with Christ, is postured now to finally no longer go on offering his members of his failing body to sin as weapons of unrighteousness. The only way the only way the believer is capable of doing this, of resisting sin's demands, is if what grace achieved is more powerful than sin's kingly command. And that's the point. That's the point. Grace and its achievements are staggering. Do you not know? 
You can't not know this. You must know this. Listen, sin is not today any weaker in you than it was any other day before. Sin is not less powerful with its kingly force. The point is, grace has abounded over it. And you, as someone new and different through union with Christ, you have grace's power to not go on presenting the members of your failing body to sin as weapons marred by unrighteousness for unrighteous ends. You're not the same person you were in the presence of the same sin. Sin wants every piece of you to weaponize itself as a tyrant in your life for unrighteous ends. And here's the shocking, and here's the sobering, here's the shameful, sad reality for us believer. The only way now that sin gets any part of you is what? If you hand it over like a weapon. You're not a slave to sin. That doesn't mean you're always smart. I certainly am not. Grace says, take it as a settled fact that you are different now. And you must no longer keep doing that. Grace has postured you in Christ to be someone new with grace's powerful achievements working for your good to resist. Grace's fight against sin and the believer, number nine, commands me to not present portions of my failing body to sin. Notice the positive side in number 10. Grace's fight against sin and the believer commands me to present the whole of me and the portions of my failing body to God. Verse 13, there's right in the middle of the verse, there is a but, which brings out the contrast, the opposite. Not only has grace's achievements changed you such towards sin that you can now refuse its enthronement and have a defensive posture against it, but you now, by grace's achievement, also have been changed toward God. You are alive with newness of life with him. In verse 4, you, um, if we have died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. And in verse 11, we are taking it as a settled fact that we are alive to God in Christ, right? That's, that positions us for something very positive. So that means grace enables you positively now to think of something profoundly different and profitable to do with yourself and with your members of your failing body. What? Verse 13, offer yourselves to God. Do it as alive from the dead people. That's you. Present yourselves to God and offer your failing body members to God as weapons. Weaponize God with your members. Marked by righteousness so that he can now achieve righteousness in your life. And what a mixed contrast we are in Christ right now. We, back in verse 6, have a sinful body. Do you remember that? You can't just say a sinful body or a body of sin. You have to say sinful body because it's, it's amplified. It's like this is a disgusting sinful body. And it is undergoing a very purposeful demise because of our co-crucifixion with Christ in verse 6. Do you remember? That body is, verse 12, a mortal body. It is a failing body. It's a titanic body, and it is also going down in that description. There's just this downward demise and inevitable death coming in this body. But you, the new you, is more than that body. Did you notice that? Present yourselves to God and the members of your body to God. You are more than that body. Listen, when you are in the slab of solidarity with sin with everybody else and with Adam, you are more than a, a failing body there too. And you are now more than your failing body. And though your body is failing, doomed to die, you are alive to God from the dead. 
and you're going in his direction. You are directed towards him, invigorated toward him while your body is failing. And grace is calling you to think, and do more than think, but to think about what you're going to do with this failing body as one who is alive to God. Grace says, don't hand over the pieces of this to the tyrant king such that it reigns in it and is weaponized for unrighteousness all the while while your titanic body is sinking down into the icy grave. Don't do that as it fails you. Instead, while your body is failing and still going down into the icy grave, hand over yourselves, offer yourselves to God, hand over the pieces of the members of that failing body to God such that he's weaponized with them for righteousness while your body is sinking into the icy grave. And that's what grace portrays to the world today. Two kinds of human beings. Those with grace and those without it. Grace wants to portray to the world through you, believer, with your failing body. Listen to this. Every every human has a titanic failing body. Whether they're in the sinful slab with Adam and everybody else or whether they're in the new slab with Christ and with other believers, there's really no difference there at the body level in that sense. But grace has made you, believer, into a new creature with a failing body. And as it fails, and as it sinks bit by bit, what makes you stand out is not that you are able to turn your body around, (laughs) but you're just doing different things with the members of your body. Not different things, the opposite things. With it, while it's perishing. You're weaponizing God with it while it goes down. Grace's fight against your sin, I don't know if you notice this, you can see it on the, on the outline, it commands me. Grace's fight against sin commands me. Grace's fight against sin commands me. Grace's fight against sin commands me. Notice then number 11, Grace's fight against sin in the believer assures me. Assures me with something. What? Sin's dethronement under grace. We're assured with grace's divine provision for us, believer. The four in verse 14 introduces the great fact, the glorious promise, and certain pronouncement that justifies what we've just been commanded to do. Why can we present ourselves to God? Why can we present our members to God as weapons of righteousness? Precisely because, verse 14, sin shall not be master over you. And that, again, is the use of the future tense of certainty, meaning it is certain now. Certainly, this shall be the case. It is the case. Sin shall not be master over you. How is it? Let's think about this again one more time. How is it that sin certainly shall not be master over you, believer? Is it because grace changed sin? That would be one way for sin to no longer be master over you. Take away its throne. Take away its desire to rule. Take away its power, its influence, its force. How is it that sin certainly shall not be master over you? Is it because grace took away sin's desire to reign as king? Did it take away sin's throne? Is that why sin shall not certainly be master over you? No, rather... Sin shall certainly not be master over you, verse 14, because, for, you are not under law, but you are under grace. Under grace. 
under grace becomes the way to talk about what grace has done, and it becomes the way to talk about our identity under grace and under the achievements of grace. We are an under grace kind of people as new creatures in Christ, and that is why sin shall certainly not be master over you. Again, the emphasis here is on our change through grace, by grace. And did you notice in verse 14 that Paul mentions law? For you shall not, um, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now, why did that come in? Well, Paul is transitioning us for the next section of Romans 6, for the next defense of the gospel to combat the next slanderous charge against grace. We'll save that for next week, Lord willing, but think on this first. Our new status that is supernaturally somehow not our old self that we were in the slab of sin. That old self was crucified with Christ. Our new status is an under grace status and identity. Look back at chapter 5, verse 21. Here it is. Even so, halfway through the verse, grace would reign as a king through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here is grace reigning as a king supremely, and we are under that grace. And to be under that grace means sin shall not be master over you, certainly. Which justifies why you can fight against the powerful tyrant within you called sin and why you can positively offer yourself and your portions to God as those alive to God from the dead. So first, under grace is just simply a new way to describe your new status under this new kingly force in your life. We are under grace people. But verse 14 pits under grace against under law, too. And that means under law is a different status. It's a mutually exclusive status to under grace status. And, and based on all that is going on here, uh, under law is not another uh, just different but acceptable identity to pursue. You know, there's the under grace Christians and then there's the under law Christians. That's not how it's presented in this chapter. We'll get to that more. But according even in verse 14 to the way that it's worded, you can't be both at the same time. You are one status or you are the other. So if an under grace status means this, means that sin shall certainly not be master over you, then if you are in the other status of under law, then that means what? Sin shall certainly still be master over you. God designed his kingly grace to be what changes everything about you. And you must be in that under grace force and power and reign to qualify for that change. God designed law. Law has many other important parts as well. And by the way, this is not specific law. This is not mosaic law. It's just general, it, it, law in general. Put rules over yourself. That has a purpose. But God never designed law or rules like that to change everything about you. If you try to get under that as a force, as a reign, you certainly will not change toward sin. Let's talk about for a moment what law can do. Law can command, certainly, and demand, right? And then depending on your response, it might pronounce you, uh, pronounce approval or condemnation over you. Law commands and demands. Law then also can expose sin and convict you of sin. 
And law can excite sin, incite sin to even more aggressive forms. Sin is seen to be exceedingly sinful when law comes around because sin becomes transgression. You see, law does not change sin. It actually aggravates it. Law can do a lot of things really well. But what law can't do by God's design is justify you, ungodly sinner. It can't. You can't pick up laws and try to do good works from them to merit a status of righteousness that God accepts. If you get under law for that, you have no hope for the righteousness, the only righteousness that God accepts, which is his. There's something else law can't do. Law can't jackhammer you out of that sinful slab of solidarity you were with in with Adam. You can't use law there to try to distinguish yourself from the rest and show why you shouldn't be in with them. You just remain there immovable under law. You know what else law can't do? It can't change you toward your sin. It can't change your relationship to sin in such that it frees you from sin. And therefore, to be under sin in verse 14 of chapter 6 means that sin shall certainly still be master over you. But the message of chapter 6 is you should have no fear. Because what law cannot do, grace does perfectly. It does perfectly. By grace, through faith, without any works of law, you can be justified. It's the only way to be justified, to receive a status of righteousness that God accepts, which is his. And by grace, you can be separated out from that sinful slab of solidarity with Adam and the rest of the lost human race. And by grace, you can be joined to a brand new people with Christ, in Jesus Christ, other believers in the church. And by grace, all that happens when you are united with Christ, crucified, Christ buried, and Christ raised from the dead. By grace, your relationship to sin changes, and by grace, your relationship to God changes. You are dead to sin, but now alive to God through union with Christ. thus meaning you are no longer a slave to sin. And this contrast between being under grace and being under law, it helps Paul transition to the next defense of grace. Everywhere Paul went and he preached the gospel of God's grace, there were those that he came across who were just far more impressed with law as a power than they were with grace as a power. So Paul just actually put law in contrast to grace, not as another viable option to consider. But not only did he do that, he, he put law as a power in its place, its scary place, as a force in sanctification. And what makes some people very, very nervous then is, well, if you do that... Believers are just going to go on sinning and sinning and sinning, but I don't know if you noticed up there, but grace has no problem commanding you and me four times in three verses. Grace isn't afraid to exhort new creatures in Christ away from sin. But how the believer is able to do that under grace is completely the opposite of law's inability to effectively keep anyone, believer or unbeliever alike, from sin as a force. Which then takes us to the second gospel defense of grace next week. I want to, just as we close, I, I 
I want to go back to the, some of the verses <laughs> Smed read during his prayer. What a perfect selection. Go, go back to 2 Corinthians 5 for just a moment. Watch how this complements each other, these two passages. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. We know that if, this, if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, and it will be one day, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It's incorruptible. For indeed, in this house, we groan. You know why you groan in this house. Lots of reasons. Romans 6 is helpful. We groan in this house, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, we will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Because we don't want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that what is mortal, failing, will be swallowed up by life. We know something better is coming. A life is coming, even though we are experiencing something with a body that's failing. We know a life is coming. It's going to swallow it all up one day. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. And by the way, when we get to Romans chapter 8 in a few years... Um, (laughs) he's going to do the whole thing again about how the spirit of God is the one in this failing body making all the difference. Grace is making all the difference. The spirit of God is making all the difference. Therefore, verse six, being always of good courage. There's a phrase I need to be thinking on a little bit more. Being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and rather prefer to be absent from the body than to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition then, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. And look what he has provided for us to be pleasing to him in this failing body. We can be pleasing to him. For, verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Rewards for us. When we hand over those weapons to God and he uses them for righteous ends. That's us. We're in a failing body. But we're more than a failing body. But we have to deal with a failing body, and grace has done something amazing for us in the meantime. Let's pray. Father, um, when I think on what I'm studying, what I'm reading, and what I'm telling my friends here, Lord, I, I, I feel like that man in the Gospels who said to Jesus, I I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Oh, Father, we, we need to be strengthened in our confidence and in our trust that indeed this is true. Father, may we today become a little more skeptical of walking by feeling and walking by faith, not walking by sight. How helpful it is to to be told that sin will continue in this body, not because we want sin, but because we oftentimes so often ask ourselves, why do I keep sinning? And what we're learning is grace is so powerful that it trumps the kingly tyrant sin through our union with Christ. Lord, may we cast ourselves on what we're learning here about you and your grace towards us in Christ. And it's in his great name we pray.